It's recording. We don't have the sound for okay. It's recording. Does it record the sound okay? Yes. So this is some joint work with Adam Brandenburger that I'd like to talk about. There's a paper, um, and uh, I'll give you a talk on a blackboard. I'm not going to try and go into too much detail, but concentrate more on giving the main ideas. Uh, but there is, a, there is a paper that's available in the archive if um, you want to get some more um, details. And I would say the main points are of this work um, that we give a unified account of non-locality and contextuality, which are two of the fundamental phenomena that arise in uh, quantum mechanics, which is in a setting that's independent of Hilbert space and in fact very general. So I won't sort of go into maximum generality of the presentation here. Uh, that, uh, the language we use to make it general is that of sheaves. Monads. Um, I won't be saying too much about that here. So it includes the usual discussion of probabilistic models, but it's much more general than just uh, applying to probabilities. And let me just mention, to give a flavour, I think some of the conceptually interesting results before um, sort of moving on to uh, present the ideas. So the first one is. Um, we know that there's a fundamental notion of the incompatibility of measurements or observables in quantum mechanics. So here, without presupposing quantum mechanics, we're able to show that under fairly general circumstances, we can obtain incompatibility uh, as a consequence uh, of reasonable assumptions rather than itself, uh, rather than something we assume directly. So incompatibility arises as a necessary consequence, uh, you'd even claim that in some sense can be empirically tested for. And this is by virtue of a result that um, um, I think original such result goes back to uh, our work with Arthur Fine in the 1980s. So I think we give a more precise and certainly much more general kind of result that we call the um, the uh, equals F theorem. Uh, so E refers to extendability. We'll see what this means. Essentially, that uh, if we think of a, a model which we set up with um, performing um, various kinds of measurements on some state, uh, on some com uh, combinations of measurements implicitly on some state, and we just have a notion, general notion of empirical model. Um, in general, because of incompatibility, we may only feel that certain combinations of measurements can be um, used in order to it can be applied to a given state. Um, and extensibility is, is impossible in principle to imagine some way of performing the experiments together uh, to give results, a probability distribution, say, which coherently reproduces the um, observations that we are able to make on the compatible combinations of measurements. So when, we, um, when this is possible, we say that the model is extendable. And on the other hand, we have this notion of the factorizability, which as we'll see is something that um, subsumes the Bell locality idea, but also applies to situations where we usually think of contextuality. So it's saying that we can take um, a measurement, which is a, a compound measurement built up of many primitive measurements that are compatible, and the statistics it gives us should be factorizable into what we can get by performing the separate uh, sub-experiments. Um, so they're uh, independent of each other. So this subsumes the locality, um, but is more general. We can show under quite general uh, broad assumptions uh, that um, 
these two things are equivalent. Which means, in fact, that um, so this is factorizability of hidden variable models. And what this means is that we can actually um, prove some of the fundamental no-go theorems which apply, which arise, which have arisen from quantum mechanics um, in a way that doesn't mention hidden variables at all because we can actually make direct arguments for the non-extendability of um, models. And moreover, this non-extendability has a clear geometric flavor, or topological flavor because of the key theoretic formulation. You said that's half a fine, right? How does that fine? Fine is F-I-N-E. When you say this is more general, this factor is you mean it's kind of weaker than locality? Or just like no, I mean that it has locality as a special case. Okay. So we'll see that in a moment. Um, now, where does Coach and Specker fit into that? Well, um, it turns out that we can also give a finer um, analysis of the strength of these no go results. So we can distinguish from factorizability or, or its um, non-factorizability, which can be seen as a kind of weak form of contextuality, which specializes to locality. I mean, this is the point of having a unified account of the two. Um, but we can have something which is stronger than this, um, which we call, well, uh, at the moment we're calling it strong contextuality which is a very strong property indeed. Um, it's easily, um, uh, so it's, I mean, there's a condition where if you're factorizable, there's a weaker property that you may have, but there are lots of models which are not factorizable um, and which nevertheless are not strongly contextual in this sense. Actually, the original Bell type of uh, models based on the ETR style scenarios are, of course, non-local, so they're not factorizable, but they are not strongly contextual. And the kind of model that Lucien uh, famously put forward, which we discussed explicitly in our paper, uh, of course, is non exhibits non-locality, but is not strongly contextual. On the other hand, so I might think that, that this was such a strong property that nothing interesting would, would satisfy it. Um, and in, uh, in bipartite systems, in a sense, that's actually true. And uh, by a nice observation by Ray, who wrote for Ray, uh, uh, by my, uh, for bipartite systems, the strong contextuality actually characterizes PR boxes. So things that are not quantum. But when we go beyond bipartite systems, things change, and actually the GHZ models in all, in all dimensions greater than two are strongly contextual. So that's already an interesting uh, thing. And we're, with Ray, we're sort of looking at the idea of the uh, connections between that and maximal violations. So we kind of uh, Okay, so that's strong contextuality. Then we can ask, where does Coach and Specker fit in? And it turns out that it fits in very nicely, and again, it, we can present it in a form which is completely independent of Hilbert space. Um, and um, what this refers to in this way of looking at things is what we may call the generic strong contextuality result. meaning something that um, holds, so, it, so it's showing that this property holds uniformly, not just for one particular model, one particular scenario, but for a whole class of them, in fact, for all quantum scenarios. So it's model or state independent. And this can be, um, again, put in a general context where it links up quite naturally with various ideas coming from logic and uh, complexity and so on. Um, interestingly, we can, in this setting, we can describe or, or characterize what we might call bell time scenarios. Um, I'll, I'll come to this in a moment. Um, and what we can, and it's 
actually very easy to show that a bell type scenario never admits a coach and specker theorem. So, in other words, the what we mean by a bell type scenario, which is the usual kind of thing, you have a, a, a multi-partite system. At each system, you have a number of observables, each of which are incompatible with each other. That's the important point, and everything in different sites is compatible. With each other. So that's the usual familiar setting for sort of these kind of results. So the geometry of those observables is insufficiently rich to admit a coaching spectrum. I can very easily show that. So, no chaos there. Okay, so that just gives a flavor of the um, kind of things that we want to discuss. Can you yes. leave this to the usual exception of two-dimensional Hilbert spaces? Because Cauchy Specker starts yes. on three dimensions. So is this yes. somehow related to the two dimensional situation? Yes. Um, so there are, I mean, you can give a graph theoretical description of Cauchy Specker. But I think, yeah, I mean, um, so I think it can be made, I think one can give a very general mathematical picture, yeah. which is more general than Hilbert spaces. Um, but certainly the the, the criteria that apply are simply not realized in uh, uh, two dimensions. Um, the, um, and actually, the, again, from this geometric point of view, or topological point of view, the reason it doesn't work in two dimensions is very clear that you don't have non trivial intersections. So, that's very much what I thought of. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, that, let's give a, a sort of a picture of our general kind of scenario that we have in mind. So this is one, but a special case of which will be these bell type scenarios. So um, here's a little picture. Which, um, so here's uh, I don't know these things, but here's Alice and Bob and Zebedee and so on. Uh, and they can choose some setting on uh, sort of to perform some choice of uh, measurement, uh, and then the measurements have some um, possible range of outcomes that can be observed. Um, so we'll um, think of, um, for each i part of the system, we'll think of a set of measurements mi. Um, and we'll take them to be disjoint, be convenient. So we're just labeling them by which part of the system they're in. And on the other hand, it will be convenient to have a single fixed set of outcomes. Now, uh, this as it stands uh, would just be what we're going to call a bell type scenario, but the, the extra structure we want to add is that we want to countenance the idea that certain measurements may be compatible with each other in the simplest possible way without sort of presupposing a particular interpretation of Hilbert space. And we'll simply do this by means of what we call a, a compatibility structure, which is just um, a family of uh, sets of measurements. In each, in each component. Um, and the one condition we'll place on this is that it's downwards closed. Which is to say, if S is a big set of compatible measurements and you take any subset, then the subset should also be compatible. Seems reasonable. Um, and then we put all this together and we form a single uh, set of measurements M as the disjoint union of all of these, and we form uh, a single family of compatible uh, subsets called the curly C, um, so we say writing it here, that uh, a set uh, of measurements spread across the whole system is compatible if uh, just by intersecting it, uh, just at each part you get a compatible family. So you see in other words that this is saying that um, um, all measurements which are in different parts are compatible.
compatible with each other. So of course the intuition is that these are space-like separated and uh, sort of quasi-independent things and I'm doing local, so in the Hilbert space terms they would be represented on different factors of the tensor product, therefore they would have been each other. Okay, so that's a very simple structure and what we get uh, is a poset then, a family of downwards closed sets, and actually as a poset this is just the product of these, uh, these posets. Okay, so this is a very modest uh, setup. Let's just notice that it specializes uh, to two things that we can recognize on the one hand as uh, bulk type scenarios, and on the other hand as what we would usually think of as coach and specker type scenarios. And this is where it gives us an idea of the sense in which we're treating both things in a, in a unified footing. So, um, well, the usual Coach and Specker discussion is just where, um, uh, I is, where there's only one part, a unipartite system. So you just have, you just think conceptually there's a single system, and I tell you for that one system which family, which sets of measurements can be performed together. So that would be the usual Coach and Specker discussion. And the belt type scenario is the opposite extreme. Where nothing at each site is compatible. Each CI is just, uh, is just a set of singletons. It's just a set of all uh, measurements like this. And that nothing is uh, pairwise compatible at each site. So this is what I mean by saying that this is a, a simple special case of this kind of modest but nevertheless non-trivial geometry as it turns out that already arises from having these, these sets laid out over these different parts. Sorry, Samson, what's capital I? Capital I is the index set. Uh, well, let me just write uh, one, one part. I say that. One part, yes, much better. In, in, um, in Coke spec, you're interested in, in different measurements, but when you... Yes. You say identify one outcome between yes. different measurements. How does that sort of is this destroy? No, the, well, there's a single. There's, as I said already, there's a single set of outcomes for all observables in the way that we're. <laughs> but the interesting point is that uh, if you have one of these families of subsets, then um, and then of course different sets can can intersect. So it's all about having interesting intersections of the measurements. And the other thing to say is. Um, Often in Coach and Specker, uh, things, I mean, so we're really focusing on the observables, the measurements, rather than the projectors. But the interesting, the sort of richness of the structure that, that, that leads to Coach and Specker type theorems comes from the fact that when we take this, just to repeat that point as it's an important one, when we take this family of subsets, the different compatible sets have non-trivial intersections. The point about the two-dimensional Hilbert space is that you don't have that. Um, and the point about Bell-type scenarios is that you don't actually have it in um, um, sufficiently rich ways. Okay, so, um, so now let's, uh, so that isn't doing very much, but uh, let's continue. When we have this structure, we can define, um, what we can think of as events or runs of a system, a system depicted as we saw it here. So if I have some measurements in a compatible set S, then um, something I'll write as little s, which is just a function which assigns an outcome to each of those measurements, is giving me a record of my observations and actually performing that set of compatible measurements. So um, these are interesting objects, and in fact what we're going to do is define something I'll call curly E, which is going to be the sheaf of events, uh, uh, put it grandly which simply sends each, measure, each compatible set of measurements S to 
all the possible results of performing that set of measurements. And you see that this has um, this has some structure to it, quite inevitably, because we we know that uh, compatible sets are closed on the subset. Wherever I have a situation like this, I have a natural restriction map, um, which takes me from uh, so I've got S in the larger set, and I can send that to. Um, S restricted to the smaller set, which lives over here. So, I'm, so this is um, an assignment that I'm calling E. So for each set S, it uh, gives me this uh, set of events or runs, and uh, it has an action of restriction. So what this is saying is that it's, uh, it's a pre-sheaf on this partial order of sets of measurements. I'm not going to belabor that point, but it's an important structure, as we'll see once we, once we have that language available to us, many of the notions that have traditionally been considered in this context come out in a very natural way. And natural is, means natural, but it's not the sense of love. So, um, and, well, I mean, it's... it's it's a trivial point, but this is, act, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to sort of, uh, but for those who uh, sort of uh, know about these things, it, it's actually not just a pre-sheaf, but a sheaf, in fact. Because uh, I have a, what that's saying is you can glue functions together in this fashion. You don't really need to this, say much about that. Is this the usual stuff from a pre-sheaf over a poster to a sheaf over the same poster with the other No, um, uh, to, to, uh, to a sheaf uh, on the poster with the Alexander topology? Because you look at lower sets in the post set. Yeah, well, be careful because the post set itself is a downwards closed family of sets. So we're not taking the Alexandrov topology on that post set. In fact, the post set, if you have a post set of downwards, a downwards closed family of sets, then it's um, a bounded complete lattice. And that gives you, in other words, if you're, if you're underneath some set, and you have a family like this, then their union will also obviously be in the family. Yeah. And also it's closed under intersection. So you have enough language there to give the sheaf condition. And actually, yeah. actually so this is a thank you, okay, so this is a good point. We, we, I made this business about there being compatible <coughs> subsets. So let me draw an important picture here. Here is here is our set of all measurements, M, and here are, here is, so to speak, the full power set. And what we're doing if you think of this as going by inclusion, so here's the full Boolean cube of all possible subsets. And what we're doing is to draw a line somewhere and saying everything below the line is compatible and everything above the line is uh, not compatible. And all the possibility of Bogo theorems comes from the fact, I mean, this is, this is going to be one of the main this sort of uh, point about extendability and factorizability, <coughs> is going to be from the fact that uh, really you can't go above this line, you can't have everything being considered to be compatible. Okay, um, so now I want to talk about what we call empirical models. So this is, so to speak, a one-off, um, we're not sort of saying, you know, we're not giving a general idea of physical theory here, but we're giving a particular instance that can arise uh, where we prepare a system in a certain way, perform measurements set up in the way we've described, and observe outcomes, and uh, obtain uh, statistics for these outcomes, if you like. Uh, in one way or another, obtain uh, results from this. So this is what we call an empirical model. So what this does is, we've got our compatibility structure here. So for every set of compatible measurements, E of S is going to be a probability distribution on the set of events there. So this is all the possible things that can happen, and we're assigning a probability distribution for each of these. Uh, when I say probability distribution here, I mean that, that would be the standard case. Let me just mention in passing that our setup is in actually in principle much more general. So we have a general notion of effect, which is any uh, commutative, any affine commutative.
assignment of um, these probability distributions as a bundle of things indexed by these um, compatible sets of measurements. But I don't want to say it's an arbitrary bundle. We have this structure here that we've described and that we want to impose a condition which is that it commutes, it, it, it respects the structure of restriction. So what that's saying is whenever I have an inclusion of one set of compatible measurements in another, uh, it should be the case that my probability distribution uh, in the smaller set is um, the one in the larger set restricted down to the smaller set. Now, here we knew what restriction meant. It was just restricting a function to a domain. So we have to explain what restriction means here for probability for uh, probability distributions. Actually, if we just we're using the language of category theory, since you know we package this thing up as a, as a as a monad, in particular a functor, we would just hit the, the restriction maps we had here with the functor, and that would tell us the answer. That's one of the merits of category theory. But I'm not sort of going to avail myself of all that here. I'm just going to write out the definition explicitly um, for the case of probability distribution. So here is, um, so I, I look at the, pro so everything's going to be discrete here. So I'm going to look at, at whatever this probability distribution for the smaller set S gives me on a particular run, little s. So this condition translates as the following. It's going to be marginalization. It's going to be saying that if I look at the smaller set and what it, the probability it assigns to performing just this subset of measurements and observing certain outcomes as specified by S, it should be exactly what I get by taking all the possible situations in the larger set, which could have given rise to the same observations. That's all the possible events whose restrictions to the smaller set give me the thing I'm looking at here, this S I'm looking at here and taking the sum over all those probabilities. So we get a picture, uh, so here's my situation here, hit at the stage S, here is the larger thing, and then in all, um, uh, here are all the things that restrict down onto this, S prime restricting down onto S, and I'm summing over all of those probabilities. Now this should not look unfamiliar. Can you, uh, can you make a split up with the monad axon? On, it's a monad on sets? Yeah, what we're doing is we're taking a monad on sets and then um, lifting it to the three sheaf category by composition. Okay. So it's just it's just composition on the end. So you can take any, any monad. On each fiber you apply the monad. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Is it, um, is it also a monad internally in the top of the top of the I don't know. You can tell the answer. I, I won't know that. Um, okay, but I, what I do want to do is, is look at this formula here, because it should look familiar. And actually, if we specialize to the case of the bell type scenario, it is familiar. So if, if we take the case of the bell type scenario, where there are no, no compatible measurements of each site, which means that a compatible set of measurements is going to have this form, where mi happens at site i, so that's all that's happening, which you could just as well think of as a tuple of measurements, acting at Alice, Bob, and all the other engines. And I look at this formula, and what, what is this condition saying? This, I'm looking at you. No, no, it's no signaling. Oh, right. This is exactly no signaling. It's saying it's the marginal, if we just think of Alice and Bob, then we're saying that, uh, let me write it like this. S prime, which is at both Alice and Bob, and which restricts just down 
in two hours to give the S uh, of um, saying exactly that. So in the belt type scenario, this naturality property is no signal. Um, but we have a more general situation. Uh, and this is already, I think, an interesting point, because I have struggled to find this in the literature. It's a very simple point. I'm not saying people don't know it somehow, but it, I, I think it's pretty hard to find this point in the literature. And, I mean, and what it can be, um, so what it's saying is there's a general form of no signaling which specializes to the usual one, in the case of these belt types and that. And of course, one question we can ask is, does this general form, which deals with arbitrary compatible sets of measurements, hold in quantum mechanics? Should we take a vote? Is it known? In fact, it does hold in quantum mechanics. So there's a simple calculation that shows this, which is in the paper. I won't repeat it. But what, it, what it's saying is worth saying, because what contextuality is about is often stated in a, over, in a, I think, confusing form by not, not, not taking account of this. What it's saying is, at the level of probability distributions, quantum mechanics is non-contextual in the sense that the probability distribution you get by performing one measurement is the same regardless of the, of the larger context of measurements you may be performing. It in. That's exactly what this thing is saying. If you marginalize the larger set, you get back what you would have done just a one-to-one measure or the whole subset of measures. And in that sense, at the level of probability distributions, um, quantum mechanics is actually non-contextual. Of course, it's contextual in very interesting ways, which are but not, not at the level of probability distributions. So, so um, and the fact is that this is a general version of no signal. So already, even at this level, I think these kind of structures are somewhat informative. And in particular, no signaling, which is one of the key structural conditions, becomes for us a framework. Uh, but once you live in this setting, it's, it's completely natural. So that's very close to the question. So does this give you some way, in all of very quantum mechanics, without this formalism, to see some direct connection between no signaling and non contextuality in a way which makes sense for any... Well, what, well, I mean, in a way, what you have to say is that uh, the interesting non-contextuality, which quantum mechanics does certainly exhibit, is of a different nature. We have to look for it elsewhere uh, and we'll find it, but also in this language, but it's not this, because this is satisfied by quantum mechanics. Now, what this naturality condition is saying in, in the category theory language is that, um, all right, so I'll, I'll just allow myself uh, this. It's saying that this thing is a natural transformation of this point, of this, of this form, where E is our sheaf of events, and this is the usual distribution monad just pointwise lifted to act here. So this is a pre-sheaf, and we're picking out a probability distribution in a natural fashion in this pre-sheaf. So it's a global section of the... Uh, Probability. And what, it, what is the domain? It's I, it's the identity? This, this, is, one, this is the one point set. Oh, okay. So it's just, the, it's just yeah. picking out an element. It's, it's, a global, it's a global element, a point or global section of this thing. So we're picking out one probability distribution at each set of measurements you can, uh, in a natural fashion. You can connect, you can express what Schwecker was saying. It's not possible to pick a point measure in each yes, context. Yes, yes. Well, um, <laughs> Physicists um, call this discussion Yes, yes. Free. I mean, the, the, the point about, the point of, yeah, the, well, all right, let's not get ahead of ourselves, but the, the as I just said, at the probabilistic level, quantum mechanics is um, uh, non contextual but if we take this away, then it is indeed to do with global, I mean, there are going to be lots of global sections into here, this is a sheet, and it has lots of global sections, yes. but the point is, there's going to be some subsheet that contains the behavior of quantum systems, and which will not have global. Yes, that, that will be the problem. It comes through very clearly in that form. Yeah, Samson, yeah, so this is what we find as marginal, right? This is the margin. Yes. Yeah. So that, that is kind of the standard version they use in the context of the Yes, well, yeah, but, well, all right, but um, usually the, that's the, the uh, usually that's uh, done in these bell types. Uh, this is holding for any compatible thing, but if you give me, uh, I mean, it, it, 
it, it can't be, it can't be not known. The, 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 the place where I did find a version of this, but not related to no signaling, is um, is um, in uh, Redhead's work. Quite a long time ago. But that's the only place I actually found an explicit discussion. So, as I say, if it's applied to the bell type scenarios, it's absolutely standard. In this more general context, I haven't seen it, but that doesn't mean so. Uh, okay, good. So, we've seen that uh, no signaling comes out as a kind of framework property, just as naturality. discussion is completely independent of Clifford's space. Um, so with hidden variable models, we're going to introduce a set traditionally called lambda of uh, hidden variables. And for each element of it, we're going to have one of these things uh, of, the, of the same form as um, what we were just saying. So I'll write it in a fancy notation like that. But concretely, this is going to be a probability distribution on um, well, that's for each variable of um, for each value of the hidden variable lambda. And again, we're going to require that it's natural. And again, it turns out that naturality here corresponds to a well-studied notion in the foundations of quantum mechanics. Um, at least if we specialize it to Bell-type scenarios. Uh, so I can write the same definition as I did here, but now replacing this thing by H lambda. Naturality would be. So, does anyone recognize this? Both types of numbers. So, in fact, naturality of these things um, is exactly parameter in the This is one of the um, Famously, it was used to factor the bell locality notion. But here, we're going to see it as a kind of framework property again. It's just um, the same kind of uh, reasoning. Um, the other framework property that comes up naturally here is that lambda is independent, or, or the, the value of the hidden variable does not depend on the choice of measurements, um, which is um, usually called lambda independence. And by the way, no one has ever proved the no-go theorem with respect to hidden variable models without this assumption. And for the very good reason that if you drop it, you can trivially prove that um, there's always a deterministic hidden variable. Theory. So the fact that you can change your measurements, keeping a value of the hidden variable fixed, and thread your way through different outcomes, is essential in making all these arguments work. I actually have an extremely general argument that you can give hidden variable things if you have no constraint on what the um, hidden variable is allowed to do. There may be weakenings of this, but this is the standard lambda independence, and it says nothing more or less in this language than that lambda is a constant creature. So it stays the same, and every set of measurements you get the same set of hidden variables and the transitions of the trivial identity transitions. So we've got um, some of the important properties of these kind of models of these kind of discussions coming out as framework properties. But now um, we can come to a more substantial uh, part. Before we come to a more substantial property, there's something else, which is... Um, Samson, can I still ask a question here? You mentioned in passing that the monad had to be affine? Yes. Where is that used? 
Uh, it's used in the proof. Ah. <laughs> uh, I cite your paper, by the way. Oh. Although you haven't read it. What? Although you haven't I read it. I certainly have. <laughs> <laughs> I made the suggestion. That was supposed I, to be found in the What you should have said was, what do you mean my paper? I've written lots of papers. No, no, I think I didn't know that. But I think you know the one I did. Semantics, Semantics of weakening. Semantics of weakening. One of my favorites, if I may. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> And of course, Cox's work is yeah, yeah, sure. providing all of the background. Now, this is actually, it was a key point, because the, the core result is E equals F theorem. At some point, you really need this, this thing. It comes out very naturally way. And, and also very generally, for any, everything is on any affine commutative moment. Okay, I'll come back to, the, I'll talk later today also about affine commutative moment. So, so um, I hope. Right, so I want to um, talk about one point, because if we introduce invariable models, then the reason we introduce them is to give an explanation for the obs for puzzling observed behavior of empirical models. And it turns out that again in this language, there's a very nice way of talking about that. So here is what we call an empirical model. So it's just giving us the probability distribution on events. And a hidden variable model, well, if I write it like this, so it's I have a parameter which is the value of the hidden variable. For each one of those, I get a probability distribution. And in addition, I get a probability distribution on the set of hidden variables. I think this is the standard idea of a hidden variable model. And the idea is by averaging over the behavior under the hidden variables, I can recover the observed behavior of the empirical. Now, in order to, what we want to do is to say when a hidden variable model realizes the behavior of a particular empirical model. And you can see once I draw this picture, that what we're looking for is a map that goes from here to here, and then we can say that H realizes E if E factors through this map by H. We compose it to get this thing. And actually, if you look at the types, one of the great things about category theory is it makes you look at the types, you can sort of see what this map has to be. I mean, this is almost like an evaluation map. Um, I, um, so I have functions from lambda into these probability distributions. I have probability distributions on lambda. So if I can pump this up to be a function from distributions on lambda to distributions on events, then I can apply an evaluation map. And because I have the structure of a on add all the bits and pieces, I can do exactly that. So this is the kind of thing that um, category theorists would call Kleisley evaluation. That exists for very general reasons for any commutative on uh, So it comes, so it's just there from mathematics. When we instantiate it to the case of probability on what actual formula does it give us for when we get this, this relationship that H realizes E? But what it says, we do it all at a particular set of measurements for a particular assignment of outcomes, is we get this expression. So this component I'm calling H capital lambda, the probability distribution of the variables. And if you prefer, we could write um, the lambda. Here we're um, making do with discrete things. So you see that the formula we get is exactly the standard one for getting the averaging over the values of the hidden variable. We, we recover the statistics given by the empirical. There's a, there's a bit of lost sight of it. So, so those arrows are actually in the top. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Those are natural transformations. Yeah. Of course, the Kleisley evaluation exists. Any can't, I mean, it doesn't need to be in the top class, but it, that works. It needs to be, I mean, if we're in a Cartesian closed category and we have a commutative monad, then you get Right, okay. So um, we now know what it means for a hidden variable model no, to, no, it's also to realize a um, empirical model. And now I want to come to a sort of substantive condition that we're going to impose on hidden variables. Which is the 
thing that we're going to call factorizability. Which is the F in this uh, And the, um, the setup is somewhat uh, somewhat reminiscent of a so we have the following situation. I have a, set, a big set of measurements S, and again, if you think of the bell type scenario, think that S is a choice of one measurement from each part of the system. And I can write it as a, as a union of a family of smaller sets of measurements, which we can think of as just the singleton measurement before we each site. So it's Alice's measurement, Bob's measurement, and so on. So what I want to do is to say that the model satisfies factorizability uh, this is going to be for hidden variables, of course, if it satisfies the following condition for any such thing. And to keep everything simple, we're going to assume that this is a disjoint column. In other words, SJ intersection SJ is empty. satisfied factorizability, if wherever you have such a disjoint cover, um, the, uh, the value here factors as the product of the probabilities you get just by considering the local pieces. Now in the case of a bell type scenario, this is exactly bell locality. Of course, it applies to any, uh, any situation we're considering. So we can think of it in general as a form of non-contextuality. It's saying not just that you can't tell what other measurements you're making, but that the, um, um, there were, I mean, you, you, you're getting, I mean, that, 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 that you actually have an independence of the outcomes on um, uh, the larger piece that you're. Uh, so it's, um, whereas the, the naturality property we looked at earlier is, you could argue, satisfied by anything reasonable, it's a version of no signaling, in particular it's satisfied by quantum mechanics, these are the general families of uh, compatible measurements. This, of course, is going to be something which in general is not satisfied by uh, quantum mechanics. So, uh, that's our factorizability thing. I mean, let me mention that... Uh, if instead of probabilities we had um, some commutative monad, then we could write essentially the same condition where this is now becomes, as it were, a product in the category rather than a product of probabilities. And we're using the, um, uh, using the fact that we have a way of going like this, which in the case of probabilities is just forming the product of probabilities. Yeah. So I'm just saying that's a, that's a general, so it actually sits in a very general setting. All right, so that's factorizability. And now with that, I can say what this E equals F theorem says. So I'm given some empirical model. saying is that the following are going to be equivalent. Um, oh, I just got rid of my little picture here. So we have our uh, picture of our post set, which is like this, uh, C. Extendability is saying is I could 
is there any way of assigning probabilities to um, assignments of outcomes to all measurements, um, dropping any notion of compatibility, which is coherent with the assignment that I've got from this empirical model. And of course, because of naturality, what this means is if I restrict to a subset, I have to recover what I had before. So that's built in from this idea of extension in this setting that we're, uh, we're going to, that we're looking at. And the, the second condition, so that's the E, the extendability, second condition, the S, is that E can be realized in the sense that we just gave here. step in proving this is whatever the FI comes up with. What does the FI have to do with the FI? What do you mean by that? Which one? The FI. Well, for our purposes, it's saying that, um, it's saying, um, well, the shortest way of saying it is that the monad preserves the term. Although that's not the useful formulation, but it saves me having to, having to write something. So it, that, that is equivalent to it preserving projections. That's the useful property. So projections weakening affine. Right. Um, so um, let's just see. So what we're saying here is we can make joint assignments of probabilities to all, uh, all combinations of measurements. And what we're saying here is we can find a sort of nice local, in, in some general sense, or non-contextual hidden variable model which retrieves the behavior of the hidden variable. And the two things are a little. So what this means, for example, is that once we have this, then in order to show some no-go result, rather than talking about hidden variable models, we can consider directly the question of whether the given model can be extended in this fashion. Um, and this comes back also to this conceptual point, which is that if we accept that there are empirical models which have, which satisfy certain, um, have certain statistics, which is kind of thing we can establish by experiment, then in some sense what this is saying is there is no conceivable way, I mean if we say that if we could perform measurements together, we could always observe the statistics and get probabilities, and if we accept the principle that we should then restrict to subsets of measurements, there is no, then, then in effect, from uh, the mere fact that we have things with certain behavior here satisfying, I mean, which, fa which violate one, one of these and therefore the other, we know that it could not even in principle be possible to perform those measurements together. So in that sense, we could say that incompatibility becomes a conclusion rather than an assumption. Okay, so I'm not going to... Um, say a lot about this, the details are in the paper, but I mean just briefly, um, if we're extendable, if we can go all the way up here, then we could take the, um, these global assignments here themselves as the hidden variables. And we can take the probability distribution we've been given on them as the given probability distribution on the hidden variables, and we can get not just a um, hidden variable model with a deterministic hidden variable model. Now, I didn't say what deterministic hidden variable model is. A deterministic hidden variable model is one that, that factors through the, um, through the unit of this monad. In other words, it gives you a sort of a, um, a Dirac measure. On, for once you fix the value of the hidden variable, each of these H lambdas is a Dirac measure which knows with certainty one particular outcome. So it's a special case of the idea of a probabilistic model. So if I'm able to measure everything, then I get a deterministic hidden variable model in this fashion. And the fact that uh, it recovers the right statistics and falls out from uh, uh, my general considerations. Um, so basically you're asking, can I extend certain local sections to global sections? Um, yes, you can put it like that. 
Yes. Another way of saying this, you. If I remember on this is on the um, this is on the um, uh, for this. Uh, so it's at the probabilistic level. Yes. Okay. So global section with a certain property. Um, no, there's, no, there's, there's no, I mean, there's no property actually. I mean, it is. Well, you're right. It is. It is about. Um, yes, you could, you could, you could put it like that. But I'm just saying it's with respect to this. Uh, in other words, probability distribution. The other way people have looked at this is saying, can I embed a certain family of Boolean algebra into a bigger Boolean algebra? I think that's different, but um, well, maybe that's okay. Uh, yeah. So I've, I've more or less explained the idea of going from E to F. For the other direction, um, the, so here we're going to use the, the fact that our first set is of a particular form. Actually, virtually nothing we've done, nothing we've done till now has really depended on the nature of the post set we're, we're dealing with. I think a couple of, I mean, uh, for some uh, closure on the to be able to talk about cheap properties and so on. But now we're going to use the fact that it's a very simple kind of thing, and in particular, uh, it's atomic or atomistic. Uh, actually, it's a simplicial complex, a family of sets closed under subset. So therefore, the atoms, um, everything is a join of atoms. And um, if you look at our definition of factorizability, if I have an S, it's going to be equal to some set of measurements like this. And these things could just be um, the, the signatures. And of course, that's a disjoint cover. So then uh, the point is, uh, under the hypothesis of factorizability, we can extend up from atoms to arbitrary subsets. Um, and because we have factorizability, that will recover the existing statistics on the sets we already have. It will also work perfectly fine for um, um, any subset. But of course, we need to show that it's compatible with restriction. And so at some point, we need the affine property. And, you know, there's some other sort of bits. The bits of the abstract definition all play their role at some point. So anyway, in, in some generality, we get this uh, result. Um, so what it's telling us is that um, we have these two two ways of looking at um, uh, this issue. Now, uh, how much? Oh, so I'm, so that, that, that brings me, I suppose, to the, uh, <laughs> to the hour. Uh, that was actually quite a nice point. I mean, of course, I could go on for another hour. But <laughs> that's a nice point to stop. Okay, thank you. So there are some clear similarities between the constructions you're making here and the, the, the work that's been done on the topics approach to Yes, so, yeah. I don't know, maybe that was an inspiration for this perspective, or maybe not. Can you say something about the connection? Well, the, the, yeah, I mean, again, there's something in the paper about the uh, connection. Um, so, yeah, there, I mean, I would say the, particularly the idea that I think goes all the way back to the original work by um, Chris Asham and Jeremy Butterfield about understanding the cohesion specker theorem in terms of um, uh, non-existence of global sections is, is a clear... Um, but, the, um, but actually, I mean, the sort of line into this was coming from looking at um, scenarios with models and... Um, uh, in, in a fairly general way, and the sort of properties of models and how they fit together coherently. I think mean, you know there was some earlier work of this kind. Um, and then wanting to uh, incorporate the idea of compatibility in a sort of minimal fashion. And when you start to do that, you see that really the sheet language is. Um, uh, but, I mean, there are some sort of differences, right? Like, you start with a little bit of space, and you think it's you think it's set of compatible yeah. measurements and the obvious. Well, we, 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 I mean, yeah, so, so, so the, the, doing exactly what you're doing. Right? It's, you, you take pre sheaves there instead of sheaves. You have a certain. Yeah, there are differences. I think, I think several. I mean, so we're, we're differences, are they? Well, um, 
the, um, I mean, for example, um, if you instantiate this scheme to uh, a setting where you are interpreting it in a Hilbert space, then you can show that there's uh, a pre-sheaf morphism from the thing you would get here to the um, uh, to the uh, spectral pre-sheaf such that, but I mean, this is kind of much more minimal, as it were. Um, but then it's uh, quite sufficient to lift the no-go result, which can just be done in this setting here. But I think there are ingredients here, like the, the use of the monads and, the, and so on, that I don't see. Any, uh, maybe, there'll, maybe there'll be some convergence, who knows? But I think at the moment it's, it's a bit different. Uh, there are connections with what we're going to see tomorrow with, with, with regards to uh, bundles in the now. So I, our, we, we are trying to understand the Born rule in terms of uh, arbitrary bundles with the extra structure. And the, the structure that we've got for the Born map is kind of uh, what it's, it's obviously related I think, to what you're doing, uh, except we've got variations at both ends of the map. The, the variation that you've got over contexts, points of the, points of the topics, correspond to one end of our Born map. And then we have some variation of the other end. So we've got we've got a condition that corresponds to your naturality. We haven't we haven't got anywhere near thinking through the you know no no go and no thing uh mistakes that we've been having very much in mind. But I think there's there's some kind of link in terms of you know getting this kind of structure and with quite some generality for uh, arbitrary toposes whose points of context, whatever you think contexts are. And contexts here are the um, third compatibility sets. That's right. Okay, so that's 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 the Samson, you start from the sets MI with the, the, the uh, with these down close subsets uh, on it. And these are the, the, the sets below a certain subset, as you said? No. No, I mean the, the interesting um, no in all the in all the interesting cases they uh, they will not be. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, if you would have a single big set that everything was a subset of, it would trivialize. I mean it would I mean we're actually I mean, you know, you would be in this picture. Mm -hmm. that, that's where everything trivializes. If if you have this picture then um, no, everything no. can be restricted no, right from the I think top. we are misunderstanding each other. This yeah. picture suggests that you have a certain bound in this big subset M, and that you look at the subsets, the, uh, the elements below this bound. Is that, is that correct? What do you mean by a bound? This is this middle. Okay, maybe what you're saying is this, which is absolutely right, that there's, you can pass between uh, downflow subsets and the maximal sets, maximal without yeah. loss of information. Now actually what I was thinking about is, is there a structure of what people call an effect algebra behind this? Where you can ha have partial joints and this determines your compatibility relation and that maybe you're looking at sheaves on tensors of effect algebras? That's a good thing to discuss. Okay. Um, but um, I mean, let, let me let me mention uh, one one thing uh, here, which is that um, um, so you have these. You can actually focus your attention on these maximal compatible sets. Um, I mean, for example, if you're looking at uh, Koch and Specker type results, that's really what you're interested in. Um, and um, you can discuss this in, in, in generality for such sets, but there are particular conditions that come from uh, quantum mechanics. Um, so, for example, here is the world's simplest setting for a Koch and Specker theorem. So here is a following set of maximal compatible subsets, which is the triangle, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, there's no way of coloring this. 0 and 1, such that exactly one thing in each set gets colored 1. Um, well, actually, I just said it. <laughs> now, the reason that isn't uh, a Koch and Specker theorem that applies to um, quantum mechanics is because you have all these pairwise compatibilities, but you're denying the compatibility of all three things together. And quantum mechanics uses a pairwise notion of compatibility. Uh, 
pairwise commutativity. So, um, so this is saying there are hypergraphs for compatibility, and a family of things here is, is a hypergraph, which don't, I mean, whereas in, in, uh, which are more general than the things you can get from, uh, you know, with sort of multi array compatibility relations. Whereas in quantum mechanics, everything comes from a binary graph. In other words, the relation is commutativity of observables, say. And therefore, the kind of sets you will get will be clique spaces of graphs. Um, and actually, interestingly, you can give conditions on the graphs to give, uh, for example, Coach and Specker theorems, which are essentially purely graph theoretic, uh, and using notions that have been studied in graph theory, such as um, having no stable transversal, which is kind of what the global section says in the graph theory setting, and there are even uh, graph theoretic characterizations of when you can embed the graph into um, So, um, so there's a more general combinatorial setting, and then you can see how quantum mechanics arises as a, as a special case. Of that as well. um, yeah. So, um, and so I'm kind of regretting I wasn't able to talk about uh, strong contextuality. But there we are. So, have you looked at the connection with the graph? Can um, how is Randall's from like empirical statistics? Exactly that example you just gave, this kind of typical thing which they have been I've, I've looked at some of their stuff, but there's probably more. I mean, I think they did quite a lot of interesting things potentially. The thing is, they have to use this sheaf kind of model, yes. but they do. Yeah. It's just all about sets and subsets, and that's yes. why it's kind of. I know, but some of I know, I mean, I, in, in, in principle, the kind of whole test space is it's mm -hmm. quite Sorry, close, but somehow there's a step that they, mm -hmm. I don't see that they took. I think opens up a much richer connection. With yeah, they have to look at compound stuff. Very much, yes, I think. yes. I mean, so here you, get, that here you get a very natural way of doing that, you know, which is kind of an intrinsic language for doing that. In fact, of course, what tools are available? What? I agree with your comments. Yeah. Very, very similar. Yeah. Okay, the time comes again. Take a two-minute break before looking. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two yeah. Yeah. I'm just asking if you remember to stop after the talk. Start. I'll stop now. I'm yeah. just wondering what difference would it make if it was on for an hour? So minutes, oh, because it makes it much easier to have the talks as separate files on the camera. Okay, so how do I stop? Just press the... Oh. And then I... Right, okay.